Welcome to Ground School USA's session on ATC and radio communications. I'm Derek Metro. I'm excited to share this lesson with you because one of the things I hear often from student pilots is how they feel less than confident when it comes to the radio and communicating with other pilots in air traffic control. Hey, that's totally understandable, so we're going to help that in this session. Nobody likes to sound like they're beginners, and it can be kind of intimidating talking with these professional air traffic controllers who in between talking to you are talking to heavy Boeing aircraft that are landing at some major terminal airport nearby. Most student pilots feel a little less certain about themselves when their hand reaches up for that microphone button. So we're going to help all that with this session and you're going to grow your skills and your confidence and your comfortability uh, talking on the radios. Whether you're a student pilot just starting out or a seasoned pilot or one that it's been a little while since you've been in an airplane. So without any further ado, let's get started. So first I want to look at the air traffic control system. Who are all the people that you talk to? Because sometimes that alone is just confusing. I think we have talked about it in this course. If you've taken the uh, entire private pilot ground school course from Ground School USA, we've talked a little bit about the control tower and different types of airports and airspaces that have control towers. There are three primary airspaces that have a control tower. Do you guys remember that if you took those courses? One was Class Bravo, another one was Class Charlie, and the other was Class D or Delta. Okay, those all share a control tower. Now, control towers come in, of course, different sizes and shapes and flavors, I guess so as to say. In other words, you're looking at a picture here of a pretty large control tower. There's a lot of people and personnel, and there can be that on one scale of the spectrum, and on the other side, a very small control tower, like in a class Delta, for example, the smallest of the tower controlled airspaces, where there might just be you know, two controllers in the control tower. Now, different positions that you have for sure at any control tower, one would be the ground controller. Okay, now the ground control uh, individual controls the movement about the taxiways and the ramp areas, uh, all the movement areas on the airport. Sometimes there's considered non-movement areas. And if you ever heard that phrase before, that just means that those are areas which you are free to move your aircraft without technically having to get permission from air traffic control, from ground control, although they sometimes like it anyway. But other than that, ground control controls all the movement of aircraft. So even if you wanted to reposition your aircraft to another part of the airport, you need to contact ground control on a distinct frequency. Each of the controllers in the tower will have a distinct frequency that you can reach them on. Of course, the tower controller, or otherwise called the local controller, uh, controls the runways or the active runways. Uh, and so if there's an aircraft that wants to take off or to land, that is going to be the local or the tower controller. Uh, or even if you just want to fly through, say you, if it's a Class D airport, you want to fly through the Class Delta environment, you'd talk to the tower controller on, again, a discrete um, frequency. Now, sometimes you're going to have some other positions at a control tower besides those two sort of obvious ones, I guess. Um, but another one that's not so obvious is what we call clearance or clearance delivery. And this would be a position at an airport uh, control tower where that person issues all the IFR clearances to IFR traffic. If you've ever, if you've begun your training um, or if you're a licensed pilot and, but you don't have an instrument rating, but you've heard uh, a controller uh, give a lot of instructions to another pilot. That was probably an IFR clearance. It's a set of headings and altitudes and frequencies and transponder squat codes. Uh, it's a whole script of things that are issued to an IFR pilot. So that clearance delivery uh, air traffic controller does that. They can also issue maybe special VFR clearances or get you in and out of a Class Charlie environment, for example, if you were at that type of airport and you needed some simple VFR departure instructions, you would also want to raise clearance delivery uh, first. The order, general order in which you would flow is if you're going out, you would get your weather first, which is usually going to be an ATIS, 
Now remember ATIS, we did address this before in a previous session, but an ATIS stands for Automatic Terminal Information Service. And that's the weather for the airport, but it's recorded usually by the ground controller or the clearance delivery controller. And it's recorded usually hourly unless there needs to be an update due to weather, significant weather changes or airport issues or NOTAMs or things like that. So you get that ATIS first and then you're to contact clearance delivery if there is one, uh, especially if you need to get a clearance, and then ground control to taxi to the active runway and then tower or local control for takeoff clearance. Coming in, it's sort of a reverse. You would start though still with the ATIS or the weather and then from there you go to the tower controller to get permission to enter the Class D for example and then from there and get your permission to land. After landing you would want to contact ground control to get permission to taxi to your parking spot. Now if you're going into a Class Charlie environment the exception to that would be you get your weather first then you would contact the TRACON or approach controller that controls that uh, airspace called a class Charlie or even the class Bravo. Okay, we're going to talk about those those controllers coming up uh, next. But that would be a, a typical typical flow in terms of the control tower. And again, the the towers are not all the same. Some of them, you know, might have one controller in there late at night in a small class Delta uh, airport. Um, it might be running both frequencies ground and tower control so there can be uh, quite a quite a bit of change all the way up to a big control tower at a major international airport with many many people including a weather specialist and a, a person who's keeping an eye on the flow and the traffic flow in and out of the airport uh, safety and all that kind of stuff okay well, let's move along to another controller that you would find and that is TRACON now TRACON it stands for Terminal Radar Approach Control. Terminal Radar Approach Control. You might know it better as Approach or Approach Control. We just kind of take that one word out of the, the TRACON and say Approach a lot of times. Um, now the, the TRACON is set up for specifically Class B and C regions. Okay, so that will help a lot of, resolve a lot of confusion because if, if you've heard about the approach controller, you might have wondered, where are they? Are they in all airports? Are they at all major terminal airports? They're going to be established in B and C, class B and C environments, as well as TERSAs. And their main function and purpose in life is to separate and sequence arriving and departing IFR traffic. Okay, so VFR traffic, they can help you on a workload permitting basis, quote unquote. But their main priority is getting uh, IFR inbound and outbound aircraft to and from uh, those major terminal areas. Okay, so they're called Terminal Radar Approach Control. Now these guys are usually in a windowless building. <laughs> Too bad for them, right? Um, some were not even on the airport field itself. They can be far away from the airport, but they're controlling airplanes going into and out of a major airport like San Francisco International or Chicago or Atlanta, Georgia, uh, places like that. So they're established again to bring those IFR aircraft in and out from these major areas that are quite busy as far as air traffic is concerned. Now they control them via the aircraft's transponder. So an aircraft has to have a transponder. If you remember looking and studying class uh, B and C airspace, you'll recall that one of the requirements to enter into that environment as a VFR traffic is to have a transponder. And that's the only way that they can get a uh, target on the radar screen is through the use of a transponder. Now there, typically before even transponders came out, you could get a reflection off of the metal skin of an airplane, but it's very unreliable and it was weak and had all kinds of issues and problems. So the transponder was developed. Now when you're VFR, you're just on a code of 1200, right? That means 1200 means that you're a VFR aircraft not in contact with any particular controller, like a TRACON controller, for example. But if you are in contact with them, then they will give you a discrete four-digit uh, code to input on your transponder. At that point, they will have control and they will give you guidance 
they will give you separation and sequencing and all that it depends on what you're doing it depends if you're just flying in route and getting traffic advisories or if you're actually arriving in some major air, uh, terminal area this is a, a very uh, typical of a TRACON facility where you actually have more of a sort of a circular uh, room with uh, computer terminals all around there which actually represent the different sectors of airspace that each of the controllers would would have jurisdiction and so literally if you're the controller in the northwest side of this room you're controlling the northwest side of the terminal airspace and so on and so forth um, I actually got to visit one of these TRACONs in Atlanta and it looked just like this. It looked like a, some kind of a set of, of Star Trek or something. And this is what it looks like to the controller. We're not going to take a, a, some in much time here to decode all of this, but they can get the you know uh, aircraft's heading, um, altitude, uh, ground speed and all that kind of stuff just from looking at these radar images. So um, again, the transponder is what allows that to happen. Now, uh, the TRACON controllers have to uh, manage quite a bit of traffic congestion coming into a small space of real estate when you really get down to it. For example, this was a, a little diagram I pulled off the internet. This is my old stomping ground, so it's, I'm kind of partial to it a little bit. This is California. This is San Francisco region. San Francisco is interesting because uh, there is a lot of congestion there as far as airspace is concerned. You have the San Francisco International Airport, which is a class Bravo airspace. And then you have class D airports, which are also tower controlled uh, airports about every five miles up and around the bay, San Carlos, Palo Alto, Moffett Field. Uh, Hayward across the bay there. You have two class Charlies, two class C's, uh, San Jose International Air, uh, Airport and Oakland International Airport. So you've got airports and airspace all over the place. And this, this particular map doesn't show all the airspace. But what it does show is what the controllers are trying to do or need to do or have to do getting aircraft inbound and outbound into San Francisco and in even to the other class, two class Charlies uh, here. And just, just very quickly, I just put this up sort of for an interest's sake, I guess. Typically, San Francisco runs 28 left and 28 right. That's these two runways right here. And if they're running, the winds are favoring that, then they have to line the aircraft up all on final here, coming down the bay. If you're coming from the Pacific uh, Ocean, Hawaii and such, you'd be coming across... Uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains here, eight, seven, eight thousand 8,000 feet, making a left turn sort of base to final, and then you're vectored on in. If you're coming in from San Diego or LA area, you'll be shot up right along the, the mountain line here into intercepting a uh, final for 2-8. Or if you're coming from anywhere else in the United States, east, if you're coming from the East Coast or whatever have you, you'll be coming down this line right here, this chute at 7,000 feet. And so this is how they have to control uh, aircraft. Now another controller that we find is the center control. We know them a lot of times as center. Uh, the full name is uh, Air Route Traffic Control Center, ARTCC, Air Route Traffic Control Center.